So without further ado, there's Mark and there's Ryan. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Ryan Lackey, and this is Mark Rogers. And unfortunately, our third co speaker, the Gruck, is not here, as you can tell. Um, I think he had some serious travel difficulties, much more than were anticipated. And there's some sketchy details, so I'm not really too filled in on it. But um, we've worked with him on this project for the last year and a while, and uh, I've been in contact with him. So, is that? Cool. So uh, I actually work for Cloudflare, a company that does um, CDN DDoS stuff. Mark works for Lookout, working on this as a, as a sort of a side project, fun, fun thing. And the Gruck is an OPSEC um, consultant and has worked on a variety of cool projects. I'm also the head of security here at DEF CON, so I apologize in advance for shouting at all of you. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, so um, we're excited to be here and uh, show off this uh, cool tune tech that we're working on. So we're going to go over um, why you'd want to hide. Uh, we're using this software to let you hide in network traffic. Uh, we're going to go over principles of operational security, which is really the Grux's main area of study, and he's pretty much the most interesting person in the field, taking how larger organizations learn about OPSEC and, apply, uh, and applying that OPSEC to the hacker community and to the activist community and all sorts of other groups that don't themselves have a huge uh, intelligence arm or anything. Um, we're going to go over some serious OPSEC fails and what happens to people and then how technical countermeasures are used against people, um, existing tools, countermeasures to those tools. Uh, and then we're going to bring in the exciting new technology, the travel routers and how to use these things for safety. So just to start, why would you actually ever want to hide? Like, you're just doing normal stuff. We're not really talking about helping people hide from uh, doing all sorts of bad stuff. This is you're in your normal life. There's a lot of reasons why you'd actually want to hide. A lot of this has become much more clear in the last couple of years, uh, especially post Snowden. But even before that, it was fairly, fairly widely understood, at least within this community. Um, part of it is to avoid um, sort of a global dragnet. You want to make sure that if somebody's monitoring all the communications, you're not sort of swept up in that. Because the problem is while you might be doing nothing at all wrong, um, somebody next to you, somebody that you have a phone call from, somebody in any loosely connected way to you might do something. And due to how software works and, and scoring, that plus another interaction plus something else, depending on where you live, could actually get you droned. Like not just like on a watch list but signature strike or something like that. Um, prevents uh, all sorts of problems but really it's just like none of your business. Like why are you, why, why would you want to be monitored? It's not something that doesn't benefit you in any way so if you can avoid it you should possibly do it. Um, then there's also the fact that maybe you are doing something that you don't want people to watch. Maybe it's something illegal. Maybe it's just something you want to ensure that you maintain OPSEC for your project. You want to maintain OPSEC for your company. People are actively trying to steal secrets, both for national security reasons and because they want to steal your secrets. And the crazy thing is people that were in uh, various illegal activities knew this. People that were in um, the hacker community knew this. But now there's a whole new realm of people that really need to worry about this kind of thing that you would never think of as spies or hackers or anything else. Journalists, people giving any sort of uh, activism in any sort of environment where their, their adversaries are well resourced, these people have this as a serious concern now and it's kind of crazy and it's sort of an asymmetric um, problem where there's people that have problems now and don't have the resources to defend themselves. There's two very important takeaways you get from all of this. Number one, OPSEC is not new. We like to talk about OPSEC and information security as if it's this new thing that we've discovered. The reality is OPSEC is probably as old, it's as old as mankind. And many of the techniques to protect OPSEC are just as old. And the other one is that the tools and stuff we're talking about, there's no rocket science here. We're talking about using existing tools, existing techniques. The difference is we're packaging it together and showing you how you can use it in a seamless way so that you don't have to think about it and you avoid that number one problem, human error. So Gruck has sort of distilled OPSEC into some basic principles um, which are listed here. We're not going to really go over them but he's, he's done this many, many times and it's um, ‑‑ Talk about the origin. Okay, so uh, Biggie Smalls actually had a great um, 
uh, song about uh, how drug dealers apply OPSEC to uh, selling crack. And uh, it's been analyzed by, uh, <laughs> by law professors and everyone else as uh, pretty good actionable advice for people that are involved in any sort of activity. And it's not just crack dealers that need these, this these days. It's people that are involved in complaining about like spying systems being installed in their local port system in Oakland or people that are worried about um, companies and potentially boycotting them due to human rights abuses or really anything. So it's, it's a pretty universal kind of problem that a lot of people have. And um, yeah. But uh, on the other hand, what happens when OPSEC goes wrong? This is a photo from Somalia where the U.S. Marines were going in during the Operation Gothic Serpent to intervene and try to distribute aid and food and stuff and get rid of warlords. Um, they, they did this opposed beach landing, which they hadn't really done since Normandy in World War II, and, uh, or in a, a Pacific Theater, but it was a, a big opposed beach landing. And um, the, unfortunately, the media knew about it in advance, so they were doing this landing with a bunch of uh, little rubber boats and everything else with a bunch of journalists sitting there with cameras waiting for them on the beach putting the thing live on satellite TV that all the warlords saw. So that's sort of an OPSEC failure. Nobody got hurt as a result of that directly, but it could definitely have gone a lot worse. And yeah. Then we've got other examples of some basic OPSEC failures, bringing down an organization that many people think was sort of a libertarian um, commercial market. When you look at many of the big busts, uh issues that have happened recently, you'll see the, op <coughs> the OPSEC failures behind them are basic, really, really basic. Take for example Silk Road, it's the largest and most successful online contraband bazaar, 957,000 user accounts, 9.5 million bitcoins, 1.2 billion in transactions. The guy behind it, allegedly, Ross Ulbricht, he used his personal Gmail when setting up uh, an account that he then used as the administrator, an account of Altoid. He then used that Altoid account to post jobs advertising for people to come in and do coding for Silk Road related projects. He also advertised Silk Road using the same account. He later on kind of caught up to this and he changed his handle, uh, changed its Gmail to frosty at frosty.com. But once you've opened the door, you've the information is out there. The internet doesn't forget. And if you start then building, it all becomes fruit of the poisonous tree. And everything you do from that point onwards is, is tainted. <laughs> Next one, Sabu, Lulsec. Even worse, Sabu, skilled hacker, knew what he was doing, used Tor all the time, except every now and then he would forget and he would log into IRC. Just once is enough in this day and age. It used to be that you could get away with one mistake, but now, in this world where it's possible for people to wholesale, capture, and store just in case there's something interesting, that one mistake will hang you. Perhaps even worse than that, he also used his home address to use stolen credit cards to buy car parts and had them shipped to his home address. These kinds of OPSEC failures, really obvious. Not surprising he got busted. Mark Capellas, again, another allegedly, we don't know exactly what's going on, but what we do know is that around the time that Mark Capellas said Mt. Gox had run out of money, completely run out of money, there were wallets that he had used previously when proving that Mt. Gox still had liquidity and had moved money into. Those accounts were still around and active. And so people started looking at them, and guess what? You followed the chain and looked at them, they still had money in them. Way more money than he was alleging they had. And unsurprisingly, when people started talking about it, he miraculously found another pile of Bitcoin that he didn't know about. So what are the common mistakes and vulnerabilities here? Um, these are just three examples, there's a bunch more. Um, there's always insider threat, which is probably the most insidious and difficult to resolve, also the easiest to, to um, to find in almost any organization. It's pretty universal. People making mistakes, human error, and then data leakage, uh, people using the wrong channels for the wrong kind of data. Um, then there's more serious technical threats. You've got people tearing down, either seizing your hardware or getting temporary access to your hardware, doing uh, live or uh, 
cold analysis on it. Uh, you've got people doing either network or RF monitoring of your systems. You've got people tearing down remote servers. Um, and then you've got active tampering with things. You've got all these, these are pretty serious uh, threats and maybe it's not worth trying to mitigate the most difficult things, start with the easy things. And then of course there's the financial and physical audit trails left by almost every system people interact with. One, one of the probably the most important points about this is you cannot take care of everything. You can't think about everything. But if you can automatically catch the low hanging fruit and protect a certain segment of your stuff that you don't have to think about, you can then focus the rest of your resources on the more complex problems. So yeah, so network forensics, pretty widely understood. Um, uh, metadata of course being the target of almost everything. Metadata is so much easier to process from the attacker side. They don't need to bother translating it into the native language. They don't need to normalize the data. It's already there. It's automated. It's trusted. It's reliable. It's the easiest thing to go after. So we've seen a lot of recent attacks where metadata really was the focus of the attack. And, and it is very much the low hanging fruit. As we saw from uh, a talk that was given at Hope, even data that you think is encrypted such as some of your personal information on the iPhone is not because when the device is running, certain segments of the device are unencrypted so that the device can operate and receive messages. That means it's, it is accessible and in fact the only time your iPhone is completely secure is when it's powered off. So there's all this kind of data you would attack from a desktop system, any sort of uh, server that you're attacking, it's all, it's, it's, it's pretty clear. Um, and on cell phones, which are basically computers, you have fairly similar kinds of targets. They have some additional threat vectors because they connect to telco networks directly and we could tell you some horror stories about baseband's but um, and the fact that they're with you at all times and they're taken into secure spaces, taken out of secure spaces, taken back into secure spaces and taken out again over and over again. It's a, um, it's a it different, it's a more interesting threat but it's not really terribly novel. The important thing to point out is this is all low hanging fruit. This is easy stuff that can be gotten off of almost every type of cell phone with commonly available tools and without expending too much effort. Yeah. yeah, all this stuff used to actually be hard. People haven't taken that into account that it has changed and it's become a lot easier to go after. Used to be you have maybe one agency in the US, one agency in the Soviet Union to worry about. Now pretty much anybody with a little bit of RF uh, equipment can be your threat. Anybody with a network router in your path can be your threat. Anybody running a service can be a threat. Anybody who gets access to your equipment. So it's a, it's a much, much wider population of people attacking you. If you're not attractive to the government as a target, perhaps you're attractive to a different government or to an individual or to an organization. It's really sort of the democratization of uh, SIGINT and, and attacks. One interesting thing from this slide is everyone's talking about the impact of Snowden and how that's changing behavior, how everyone's moving towards more encrypted. It has had an effect on the traffic on the internet. We've gone from in the US, 2.29% of traffic was deemed to be SSL traffic. Today, it's 3.8. That's a really big increase, right? <laughs> Yeah, and a lot of that traffic that's unencrypted, of course, leaves all this data available. Um, even if the data is encrypted, you can get a lot of information just from pure traffic analysis. You can see um, source and destination of target. You can see the type of traffic in a flow. You can actually, in a lot of cases, get content information just by the sizes of packets and how they interact because it's not data independent and it's, uh, it's pretty terrifying. And what you have to realize is a lot of the time you don't have control over this. The vast majority of this traffic is back end traffic. This is your application talking to an application server. You don't have a choice to say I'll only use encryption because that's up to the dev who built your app. Yeah, it's pretty bad when you pop up a commercial operating system on a new computer the first time. It's got all this other software that you're not really familiar with and uh, you don't really know what's phoning home when. Uh, cell phones are even scarier because you actually do have uh, pretty good information that they're phoning home all the time. They're always in contact with the tower and they're relaying an awful lot of information that you don't really ever see as a user but is there and is a, is a threat. And the scary thing is while you might trust your operator and you might trust your phone vendor, over the air a lot of this data can be gathered just from passive monitoring and anybody else who's over the air can do a lot of this stuff. Uh, and then we've got examples of when you travel to places like China. 
Uh, China is a great place to visit, but they have a fairly restrictive international firewall, the Great Firewall, and you don't really know where it's, how it's, it's not really one firewall, it's a different firewall in every province and different operators have different policies, but in addition to being monitored, there's a, just a basic problem of stuff is blocked and it's really annoying when you go and you want to connect to your services, you want to, um, to basically operate like you would at home. You'd think just a VPN would protect you but, and would allow you to bypass all this stuff, but in a lot of cases, it's a sort of a whack-a-mole game they play where they block different VPN technologies all the time. So it's a pain to deal with. One, probably one last thing on the, the Chinese firewall is they're actually getting smart with how they're looking, after v, looking out for VPNs. Before it was identification of VPN endpoints and they get blocked. Now, as we've seen with Tor since about 2011, they're actively scanning suspected nodes and they're doing things like talking Tor to suspected nodes. And if they get a reply, they flag it and they block it. But that makes it really difficult because now you've got folks who are actively looking for all your tools and blocking them. So whatever you have to do has to be robust enough to protect it. So there's a bunch of tools that people use today to help users protect themselves and they're provided to users. Um, some basic principles that make certain tools easier to use and more privacy protecting than other tools. Uh, generally I would say decentralized tools and tools that are used by smaller communities rather than a wider tool are going to be more likely to work in any given scenario. Um, although there's an engineering quality issue of a tool that's not used by very many users isn't going to generally be as high quality. Um, issue, generally I like things that aren't real time, things that are uh, asynchronous like email based systems rather than connection oriented systems. However, we've really moved to the world wide web and everybody wants to use connection based systems and it's, it's sort of a pain. And then encryption, even if it doesn't provide you with full protection, does provide you with a little bit of, of content protection in a lot of cases, uh, even if it's not implemented terribly uh, thoroughly. So if you get the choice, always add encryption. Uh, and then there's a lot of common tools that can be reconfigured. So VPNs were never really intended as this, and an, it's certainly never intended as anonymity technology. They just happen to be useful in certain circumstances. They do provide some privacy and they provide some firewall busting just because people don't want to block all VPNs because it'll block, block a lot of business traffic. So it's, it's an interesting thing. And then there's the, the really awesome thing is that cheap hardware has gotten so cheap that you can dedicate a given piece of hardware to a certain task. That it's really, really hard to build a secure multi-user, multi-application operating system. It's really a much simpler challenge to build a single um, purpose device and dedicate it to a, to a certain thing. Uh, before we move off of uh, VPNs, one amusing thing that came up in our discovery is we were playing around with the Great Firewall. Um, we discovered that you can actually weaponize it. So the, the Great Firewall works that yeah. when it detects a node doing something it doesn't like, it floods it with reset packets. And it's not really doing much to validate the source address. Uh, so <laughs> it's also quite nice that it floods it with reset packets for sometimes up to 30 seconds. So it's an amplifier. And so I was just playing around at a, a, a another conference that I won't mention. Um, and I sent some packets spoofing a, a, a colleague and, and watched as the great white firewall flooded him with reset packets for the next couple of hours. <laughs> and he couldn't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think not demoing that live on the stage is probably a good idea. <laughs> Although I highly advocate doing this, but carefully. <laughs> so tempted. Uh, cool. So yeah, we've got things. The other thing that's really scary is JavaScript. Um, JavaScript, any sort of executable separate, when you don't have a great separation between your data and your code, um, bad things happen and a lot of the problems with anonymity tools leaking information is either when addressing information is somehow conflated with the messages so the ISO stack isn't or the OSI stack isn't really um, uh, kept as, as uh, separated as it should be or where code is mixed with data. Um, these things lead to very bad stuff. Um, as we were saying, like cheap hardware is great. Um, it prevents a lot of user errors. The problem with, with a lot of these secure systems is users use them incorrectly. And if you give somebody a single device and say that's for talking to one other person, that's a much easier user model than 
you need to enter this code every time you use it, you need to authenticate them and do all sorts of other stuff. I had a great real life example of this um, literally yesterday. Uh, as part of my, my, my goon job, I had to provide protection for John McAfee. And we're walking around with John, who's a colorful character, is that very interesting? <laughs> with his security detail, who are even more colorful, uh, especially the one who remembers faces. Um, and he's, uh, he was talking about security of his phones. He's like, I always use burner phones and I'm very careful that once I've used a phone for a certain amount of time, I attach it to a lorry and it goes off around the country and they can follow that. But they always track me down within a couple of days and find me again. And uh, so I had a chance, I was a side by I said, uh, by any chance, do you regularly call the same kinds of numbers? And he said, yes. Like, that'll be why. It doesn't matter if you're changing your phone if you keep calling your mum. <laughs> yeah. So one of the issues is, again, if you go buy this hardware and you order, it's this whole interdiction problem. If you order hardware from the internet and you're at all an interesting person, your odds, if you're, especially if you're receiving it internationally, if you're, say, the Gruck, are going to be pretty high that that hardware is not going to come to you exactly as, as the hardware vendor intended it. And you probably want to start buying stuff off the shelf that's pre-configured or it's, it's a sort of a commodity thing. Because it's unlikely that they're going to backdoor every single piece of hardware that's a retail thing out there. But the one piece of hardware that Gruck orders is very likely to be backdoored. And cash is great. And Bitcoin is not so anonymous. Um, and then the same thing sort of applied to, a, to accounts. Um, Cool. So uh, VPNs are, are sort of near and dear to my heart. I ran a VPN provider for about a year and then we shut it down when the lava bit thing happened. Um, they're definitely a useful tool. Um, there are some concerns. They're not end to end. They're not fully, they're not really designed for anonymity so they don't give you anonymity. You have to use them correctly, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and then there's of course the problem of you're trusting the operator of some service to one, operate in a certain way and you're not keep logs and things and two, it's really, really a bad idea to ever expect a third party to break the law on your behalf for like three dollars a month and uh, yeah, it's not going to happen. So you're going to have data turned over. The third party doctrine in the US means that a server provider really has very little ability to protect their customer data if it's, if, if it's being sought for the, the customer. So there's that. So there's some cool stuff that sort of counters this. Um, there's Tor. Tor is a great tool. Um, it can keep you anonymous. Um, I believe uh, uh, Snowden has endorsed it. Lots of other people have endorsed it. But it's got some disadvantages. It has a very recognizable sig as, as the bottom fault. It's a very recognizable signature. It's a high profile. Lots of people looking for it. And it's uh, pretty complicated and not really so simple for users to understand just the concept. It, it's, it, yeah. So there's some, there's some complexities. You have to build additional systems on top of it to make it usable. Uh, Tor browser bundle, Tails, Unix stuff are, are great. but you pretty much need that level of additional tool to make it a, a really useful end user tool. Um, however, it's got some enemies. Um, if you're trying to use it in a place like China, they're getting better and better at blocking it um, if it is the default Tor protocol. Um, uh, deep packet inspection and then active net. Deep, deep, pack of an, deep packet inspection can block it. And then, of course, if you have um, exfiltrated data from some secure network that logs everything, there might be a human analyst looking at it after the fact and the Tor traffic will be pretty obvious. So whoever sent the Tor traffic is, is bound for a visit. So there's that. So people realize this is a problem and they come up with uh, transforms. Um, there's a few. There's the port Tor pluggable transports which is this great tool. Uh, there's seven of them that are live right now. I think this is still accurate and there's a couple that are much more popular than the others. The benefit of the Tor pluggable transports is they've recognized that there is no one tool that will solve the problem. There's no silver bullet. And whatever solution you use needs to be variable because if you keep doing the same thing, eventually someone's going to catch on to it. Plus, if you open this up and make as many people develop as many different things as possible, you're going to get some real genius. And honestly, some of these pluggable transports are phenomenal. Um, we'll go quickly into a, a couple of them, but the general concept of this is to take door traffic and to transform it so it doesn't look like Tor traffic. And then the next level up from that is to take this transform traffic and to make it look plausibly 
like some other form of traffic. Cool. So I'll we'll just go through these really quickly. Um, There's a like, um, scramble to read, move on. Uh, yeah, so the nice, this, this is probably one of the, one of the best ones. A lot of the censorship tools out there are quite crude. And what they do is they use regular expressions to look at the protocol and make a judgment as to what they think it is. If you use those same types of regular expressions yourself, you can play to them and make your traffic look like whatever you want. The snippet on the screen here is transformed Tor traffic that has been put through a, a transform that makes it look like SSH. And while it won't stand up to immediate scrutiny, any of you who are familiar with SSH looks at that, you'll say it's clearly not SSH. The point is, with this vast volume of traffic going through, the only people who are going to get that special extra scrutiny are people who have popped up a red flag. This is about not popping up that red flag. So long as your traffic hides amongst the general tour traffic, there's going to be no reason for them to dive deep enough to say this is suspicious. And then there's an additional tool where if you have a cooperating endpoint on the other end, you can actually, such as Google App Engine, uh, I've talked about this with Cloudflare, various other providers, um, you can enc encode your traffic as normal HTTP traffic and then also put it inside HTTPS. You can make it look like it's going to a regular website. You can do a lot of cool stuff there. Um, so. And then I, may, I guess the ultimate thing would be to make it look like natural language. Uh, Banana Phone does this. It obviously won't stand up to a uh, human analyst looking at this after the fact if you aren't routinely uh, sending literature back and forth uh, with someone. But you could imagine a scenario where you, where this evades an automated detection system or even where you build a system on top of that that does other stuff. So, and there's of course the classic uh, network tunneling tools that are primarily used for getting around like uh, captive portal um, authentication systems for DNS tunnel at a hotel such as the Rio, which, uh, yeah, um, and then things like HTTP tunnel. These are pretty cool. So. And the point of going through all of these is these are the tools that we looked at for building the, 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 the travel router. The travel router itself, there really isn't that much to it. But what we did was we looked at all of the best tools out there and we built them into this as a library so that you have an OS build that's going to sit on device. In fact, this is one of the travel routers that you can carry anywhere. It's tiny. And all of these things will be available to you to choose. And we're hoping to build some, some intelligence onto it as well so that it will make some of those choices for you to say, are you sure you wanted to select that? That might not be the best thing for here. Yeah, there's no silver bullet, so it's a bunch of separate tools that are combined. So as we were thinking about this, we, we tried to figure out, because we had the practical concern, we travel a lot, we go to places, we're not really the most interesting targets, but we get some level of target, and I know a lot of people that are much greater targets, and it's really difficult. I can build something that I can use myself mostly out of existing software, but building something I can have somebody else use that's easy for them to use, simple, that I don't have to then go with them all the time is a much harder problem. Uh, we looked at a lot of the VM systems. VMs are great, but um, the the problem is if something gets subverted in the host in a, the the top level operating system, then there's some problems. Fingerprinting stays the same, and there's really no way to know that the system is intact. You could I worked on a lot of stuff with the TPM tamper resistant computing stuff, and it still is not quite there. So uh, there's that. And the other problem is this stuff's expensive. If you were to build it out of pure software on dedicated high-end laptops with virtualization and a bunch of like 16 gig RAM MacBook Pros and everything, um, you can't really afford it. Most of the people that really need this stuff are also people that are not rich. So they're also not willing to throw away a $3,000 laptop every time it might be compromised. So um, yeah, it wasn't really the, the most ideal target. So we looked at something that would be providing m much of the same protection but would be a lot cheaper, a lot easier to use, a lot easier to support, and ideally something that people already have to use. And we came up with the secure travel routers being the sweet spot. They're pretty awesome because they're like, I have a whole box of them. Uh, they're like 20 to $100 each. They're made by a bunch of vendors, TP-Link, Linksys, uh, D-Link, like all the standard low-end network companies make this stuff. Um, they're available everywhere. A lot of people use them when you go to a hotel and you have to pay per, um, Wi-Fi device or per MAC address, 
this lets you share it or lets you share a wired connection in a hotel room with a lot of connections. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do but they really weren't explored as a security tool very much. Um, one of the challenges we have though is the, the hardware is incredibly variable across the whole range. So some of them have a, a fair amount of flash memory, some of them have almost no flash memory. So the, the code we're, we're putting together at the moment is a bit basic but the, the, the next version of it is going to have a kind of a kitchen tool. And what you'll do is you'll put in the version of travel router that you're working with how much resources it has or we'll look it up in the library and know how much resources it has and it will then tell you which modules you can select. So you can have Tor plus these transforms or if you want to have secure voice you can have the SIP phone plus these other things added in just enough to squeeze it in without filling it up. So yeah we, we've used a lot of open WRT um, built on that. Uh, there's a lot of open source firmware for these routers, for home routers. People have done this. I think, I think maybe the Linksys WRT54GL or 54, 54G was the, uh, the granddaddy of all this stuff where it came with pretty crappy firmware. You added awesome firmware to it that was free and you'd have a great device. Um, unfortunately, wireless hardware has moved on so you need to use newer stuff. But that whole wireless router hacking community has been going on for a while. It just hasn't been focused on the travel router market or the building security tools into it market. The EFF has started working on a, a project to make secure routers for home use primarily focused on protecting them from outside threats as opposed to using them for security tools themselves and that's a huge improvement over the status quo even a year ago. Uh, the problem with these things is they're, they're embedded systems. There's like a billion different ones of them. And the, the tool, the tool chain process, they're too weak to like self host. So it's a, it's a, it's a pain. It's not a huge pain. It's not as much of a pain as dealing with true very minimal resource uh, embedded stuff but it's still not the easiest thing to do. Other people have worked on this stuff before. The Pogo plug guys have a safe plug which is pretty cool but they don't do pluggable transport. They have Tor. They don't do pluggable transport. It's not really a portable device. It's more for home use. Um, Onion Pie which Adafruit, the awesome company has, is sort of like a learn how to do something project. It uses a, a um, device, uh, Raspberry Pi and has some external Wi-Fi hardware and stuff. And there's Portal which I found out about when I started talking to Gruck. I'd been looking at this stuff individually and then I talked to Gruck and then I realized the guy who was working on Portal was actually the same Gruck that I had been talking to on other stuff. So it was kind of an obvious thing to do and Mark and Gruck have known each other for forever. There is so only <laughs> one Gruck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not that, that uh, rare a name. So yeah. Um, so we worked on this. Um, the original portal from a couple of years ago had Tor, Pluggable Transports and Voice but it was a huge pain to install. There's just like a GitHub page for it. And it did a lot of the stuff but it wasn't like an all in one thing. So out of this full range of hardware we needed to come up with an initial piece of hardware that we wanted to support as a development environment. Um, the Qualcomm Atheros AR9331 which is used in the Hack5 Pineapple, used in a bunch of travel routers, it's super cheap in quantity, is awesome. The problem is, uh, it's a, there's a different page about that, but yeah, it's an awesome piece of hardware. Um, we wanted to have a pre-built image for it and multiple ports. The other thing is we really want to be able to power it off of USB because then you can use USB batteries, you can power it off your laptop and uh, one use case for this is you use something like a Nexus 7 or a cell phone with a baseband turned off and you want your mobile phone to be able to talk to this device which then has a uh, Wi-Fi connection or a, a 3G connection plugged into it thrown in your bag. So having something that can be battery powered is great but putting a battery into a small cheap device is a more of a consumer engineering challenge for us. So we're not really all hardware guys so it's trying to make this as simple as possible made sense. And obviously it needs to be easy to use with a GUI for configuration. Uh, but there's some problems. A lot of this hardware is designed to be as cheap as possible when you make it in like million unit quantities. It, um, the price difference between like a 64 meg RAM chip and an 8 meg RAM chip is substantial in those quantities. So they put the absolute minimum amount of RAM, absolute tiniest flash they can possibly do in these devices. And we wanted to have multiple radios and multiple ethernets in a small device which wasn't really a common use case. Uh, the other problem is we're sort of in the middle of 802.11n versus 802.11ac. Um, USB 2 is still the most widespread power protocol we could use so we're limited to 500 milliamps. Um, radio quality on a lot of stuff is actually really, really bad. Uh, they're using questionable antennas and the whole RF chain is pretty questionable. And then um, we wanted to make it ourselves but 
making quantity like a thousand of making quantity like under ten of something is really easy because you can make it yourself. Making quantity like a hundred thousand or a million of something is also fairly easy because you can justify amortizing your de dev costs over a large number of things. But making like a thousand of them or five thousand of them is still a pain point. Um, and we looked at the cost of making them. You can buy these travel routers for like a hundred bucks, uh, twenty dollars, whatever. Um, for us to make a small quantity of them was going to be really expensive. And there's a problem of if we make the special secret spy router that everyone can use, one, we have to distribute it to all the people that want it, and two, it's itself very suspicious. So the guy carrying around the super secret, secret spy device is going to get special attention and like special attention is the absolute last thing you want in any of this case. So we were kind of, kind of screwed. Speaking as someone who gets special attention every time he goes to the airport, I can tell you it's a real drag. So we really had no idea, like I'd been working on this as a hardware thing and ended up uh, selling my company, I was looking at doing something and I ended up selling my company instead and doing some other stuff at Cloudflare. So uh, it was sort of like a back burner thing and then I was like, oh, what are we going to do? And then we were saved by China. Um, there's apparently a company in China that makes the perfect device. It appears to be a clone of a much more popular device but it happens to have a huge amount of RAM and a huge amount of ROM and they're really cheap. Um, it's, it's this box, the, the uh, Good Life uh, GL iNet box. You can buy them for like 215 bu bucks per 10 of them. You get them in three days. Uh, they're, they're awesome. Uh, it does everything you want. It's pretty much the perfect hacking platform uh, for this kind of hardware. Uh, it's got two Ethernet ports on it, um, USB, and the micro USB for power. So it's pretty ideal. And the RAM that we need. So we've got uh, portalmask.com. We've got tools that are loading up there that will let you effectively use the old portal tool chain and then additional pluggable transports on it. Um, building the, the server side of it is maybe a little bit ambitious at this point but definitely the, the client side hardware that will work with existing services. Cool. That's, that's it? Yeah. <laughs> So here's the exciting thing. Uh, we'd actually like questions at this point and things that we're going to add to dev features. So it would be it would be great to talk to people. And obviously we'd welcome a ton of feedback because we want to shape this into a tool that's genuinely usable. Um, this is no good if it's hard to work with. It doesn't quite meet all the use cases. We want this to be the kind of thing that you pop in your pocket that a journalist can take, go to a foreign country, and use it for secure comms without even thinking about it. And open source, obviously, and non commercial. Yep. Thank you, and questions. Anyone has questions? We'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, absolutely. Huh? I think I was a smaller. Uh, this is more RAM. Okay. That's the difference. This is a clone of. Yeah. This is a clone of the 703. The 703. Okay. So they're great. The problem is less RAM means less stuff. And what I ultimately want to put on this is, I want there to be uh, a SIP phone. I want there to be a uh, tour with all of its pluggable transports. Um, and I want to put on some uh, tools so that it can actively probe the networks it's connected to and make some judgments about the kind of networks so that you, it can give some guidance and give a little bit of advice in terms of the level of security that the user is experiencing at that point. So we've got a whole system where it's a portal to the system where it's a IPsec, so is it after um, we give a similar talk, gave a similar talk at Hope, and after the feedback we got from that, we've started putting together this kitchen tool so that you guys can use anything you want. There just may be some trade-offs, right? If you put some of the uh, tools onto uh, a, a USB device, perhaps it's not going to be quite as fast. There may be some UI issues. Um, um, but likewise, maybe you don't care about the SIP phone and you just want something that has all the tour stuff in it. This will allow you just point and click, choose what you want, build the image, flash it to your device and off you go. And the big benefit of that is if we can have a ton of people with a ton of different devices doing it, it makes it much harder for them to say this is the bad thing. Yeah. 
I mark. Okay. <laughs> I, I do, but honestly, it's really not that difficult. Just any of the um, uh, existing IP spoofing tools, just. Uh, my contact details are on there. Ping me, I'll give you some guidance. Huh? It's yeah. on the last slide. I have both already know addresses. Uh. So, do you have any, any ideas about like grabbing adoption of this? Like, it's great that all the hackers here would love to have this and see the importance of it. Now that you've made it pretty trivial to use and carry, mm -hmm. how do we get like my mom to use it? That's a good question. That, yeah, that is a great question. We're contemplating like maybe we should do a Kickstarter. Maybe we should push out a few things. Maybe we should donate a bunch to the EFF and and have them give out. Yeah. I'm kind of hoping that. As people start to use it, more people will hear about it and want to use it. Um, we've got a couple of really nice little things um, tucked up our sleeve. I've been talking to a, a global telecoms provider who are potentially going to give us a global SIM that we can put in this and bundle a chunk of free data. So at that point, you have a pocket travel router that has a uh, 3G bearer no matter where you are. And so now, like, this thing will get you going before you've even checked into your hotel. And I think at that point, it's going to be useful enough that people will start using it. And then the security features will kind of come as a benefit. Right. Cool. Very cool. Awesome. Great talk. Thank you so much. Thanks. The code is already up with the basic stuff. Um, it's a I, it's a living project. It's, it's, uh, I would be really happy to have the kitchen and most of the UI done by the end of this year. So I found trust a company to develop a home server with a lot of features what you just shown. Also with uh, secure email key on the yeah, yeah, we were thinking about it. The problem and then is a huge research on the uh, universal, universal available hardware. Yeah. 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 I found the hardware yeah. 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 until we find I would like to if you with the hardware. Please. So um, I, um, I, I don't unfortunately, um, but on the slides, my email address was there. Um, you can give me an email, or I can give it to you now. No problem. Yeah, it's easy. Cj at shady.org.